So welcome to uh, Managing Open Source Vulnerabilities for PCI DSS Compliance. We're going to have about a half hour of content here. We like to keep these short because we know you have a lot going on in your day. And, um, you know, we can always take the conversations to email or Slack afterwards. My name is Jen Geil. I lead uh, community and education here at Endor Labs. Uh, before I came to Endor Labs, I was with Nginx with F5, but what's most relevant to the topic that I'm gonna be talking about today is my time with the State Department. I was with the State Department for about 13 years. And while I was there, uh, a big part of my job was writing policy. And so uh, there's a lot of overlap between writing policy for the State Department and uh, dealing with regulations such as PCI DSS. And in particular, the part that most people uh, probably are more on the receiving end than the inputting end is the complexity of figuring out what did the writer of the regulation mean when they wrote the thing. And so I've been on both ends of that. Uh, often the person who's written the policy or the regulation thinks that they're being very clear, thinks they're being very specific, but as we all know, uh, often when we're trying to interpret it, it's not as straightforward as they meant it to be. And so what we're gonna be talking about in this session is a very specific change coming to PCI DSS in version four that'll be implementing in next year. So right now, uh, if you're required to comply with PCI DSS version four, uh, you're obligated to manage your highs and your criticals for vulnerability management. So that's as of today. The change that we're going to be talking about during this session is specific to this topic. There are lots of little changes that have happened with the 4.0 regulation. The one that we're going to focus on is about what you have to manage. And the change that's coming in uh, will be effective as of March 31st of next year is the requirement to manage all severities. And the reason we've chosen to talk about this very, you know, it's a single line item in hundreds of pages of regulation, uh, but we're gonna talk about this very specific one because there's a lot of anxiety about what does it actually mean to manage all severities. What does that mean for my AppSec program? What does that mean for my GRC program? What does that mean for my developers? And so uh, with me today is Darren Meyer. Darren, can you share with the group a little bit about your background uh, in terms of what you did before you came to Ender Labs? Yeah, sure. So uh, I have kind of the opposite uh, viewpoint of Jen is I'm the one who got stuck implementing a lot of this stuff. Uh, so my, my background is largely software development and software security. So I've been doing software security in AppSec and product security roles for, and it's coming up on 25 years now, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I, I led an AppSec team at CrowdStrike. I built security programs at Target and US Bank. Uh, I was a security researcher for eight and a half years at Veracode. So I have a, a really good sense of kind of what it takes where the, where the rubber hits the road on these kinds of things in terms of implementing technologies and implementing programs to meet these things that compliance is telling me I have to do. So in your uh, experience as an AppSec professional, that's where we're going to kind of double click down and talk about what this manage all severities new requirement means. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, language and intent matter. And so we're going to break down two terms that may seem very straightforward. But I, as I talk with people, people often have different interpretations of those terms. And so the terms are manage and vulnerability. So we'll start with what is a vulnerability? Um, we're used to thinking that vulnerability equals CVE. And um, you know that can often be a fair place to start with what a vulnerability can be. But the thing to keep in mind is that the CVE is actually an advisory. It's not telling you that this is a vulnerability for you. It's saying under these specific conditions, you could be vulnerable. Uh, you aren't necessarily at risk depending on your threat model. So a CVE also uh, vulnerabilities can go beyond malware. So in terms of what does a vulnerability mean for PCI DSS, uh, there's an auditing firm that we work with called Shellman that we've talked about this in depth with. 
And so I'll share the very simple explanation of what it is according to our auditing friends. It's anything that can cause serious harm to my environment. Uh, what is serious harm? What is my environment? That's everything that you're gonna be addressing in your threat model. So uh, Darren, when you were running AppSec programs, how were you determining what could cause serious harm to your environment? Uh, so you, know, you mentioned CVEs and that was like where we kind of started most of the time was, hey, we have these known things. We're gonna to need to look at each one of them and say, is this gonna affect us? Uh, is it easier to figure that out than to just patch it, right? Those kinds of things. Uh, but we also looked at our threat modeling exercises and said like, you know, where where would a given vulnerability have to be to cause serious harm to us? And then also like what's in scope for this regulation in terms of, you know, what is my environment from the auditor's point of view? It's not everything, it's stuff that's gonna be in scope. And it was, how do I get things out of scope as much as possible? Yeah, and keeping in mind, of course, for PCI DSS, that's specific to uh, transactions, right? So there may be things that could cause harm that are not going to impact the types of programs that fall under the PCI DSS umbrella. So, uh, you know, step one is defining in your organization what constitutes a vulnerability based on PCI DSS. The second thing is, okay, you've decided what your vulnerabilities are. Now, what does it mean to actually manage them? The way that we think about managing uh, in this industry is we often equivalent manage to remediate. And this is where uh, I think the most important distinction could be is remediation can be one of those steps, but really all it is, is you have a risk framework and you have required actions. And so depending on your threat modeling, uh, your organization's risk tolerance, the impact that something can have on your, your environment, it's going to dictate the types of required actions that you might take. Remediation is definitely one of those actions, but for example, Darren, what, what might be a different action that you would have taken? Well, so we had, we had the standard like four risk treatment things, right? So we could remediate, mitigate, transfer sometimes, not very often anymore, or just avoid the risk. The The key thing for us was always in communicating with auditors, it couldn't be like thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. We had to say like, we have a system and a set of tools that are part of that system that tell us which thing we're going to do. We're not just making a decision in a boardroom with the, the CISO going, I don't wanna spend money, right? Yeah, it needs to be defensible, right? We'll come back to uh, what can be included in that framework, but I wanna make a quick, oh no, I moved things around. We are gonna talk about it right now. So under uh, PCI DSS in 6.3.1, that section is all about uh, setting up the program itself and um, the different types of controls that you have. And what I like about this section, I don't know if anyone actually says they like things about regulations, but what I like about this section is it does put it in your control. And so I'll kind of highlight this area that's boxed right now. Vulnerabilities are assigned a risk ranking based on industry best practices and consideration of potential impact. So you do actually have a fair amount of latitude when it comes to defining what does it mean to manage a vulnerability. Uh, but again, as Darren said, it's not based on hopes and feelings. It's based on a framework that your organization has adopted and is clearly defensible. So that segues us into a, a quote from Joe O'Donnell, who is one of the people that we work with at Shellman, the auditing firm that uh, we consult with on these topics. And uh, while it's lengthy, uh, this is a very, very important statement. And so I'm gonna read it and then we're gonna talk about it. So what Joe said is if an organization has performed a detailed assessment of a vulnerability and determined it does not require remediation, then we consider it to have been managed in alignment with PCI DSS. Now, as the disclaimer says, you should consult your auditor, but essentially he is uh, summarizing here that we're looking at, did you do an assessment? Did you determine that the risk is uh, not going to cause serious harm to your environment? Fantastic, you've done your job. We'll segue from here into the second part of this conversation, 
which is specifically about open source vulnerabilities. And the reason that we've chosen to focus on open source vulnerabilities is because this is going to be the vast amount of vulnerabilities that you're facing when it comes to application code. And there's a couple stats here. Um, when I do this talk in a room, we kind of play a little guessing game of what these stats align to, but I'm just gonna go ahead and give it away. So two things that we should understand about open source is one, uh, it's estimated that 97% of apps are using open source software. So that is a tremendous number of applications. That should be everyone who's here on this call that has some kind of application security portfolio there's open source somewhere in your infrastructure. The second number, which is a fairly new citation, uh, came out of, I believe, Harvard Business School, is it would cost globally $8.8 .8 trillion to develop all of that open source code from scratch. Uh, now, all of this is to say that open source is here to stay, that it's serving a really important business need, but that because it's representing such a huge chunk of application code, that it does need to be a big part of your PCI DSS compliance strategy. Okay, I'm gonna do a quick check-in. See, we've got a lot of people here in the um, room that have been trickling in throughout the session. So before we move on to talking about managing these vulnerabilities, these open source vulnerabilities, uh, if you have questions, please use the Q&A. Uh, you're welcome to chat us in the chat, but we will keep an eye on the Q&A throughout the session and uh, answer questions as they come along, if they're relevant to what we're talking about, or we'll catch them all at the end. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the session is re being recorded. Uh, since everyone here is registered for it, you'll get the recording uh, after the session, and you can go back and catch the parts that you missed. So... What we need to do when we have open source vulnerabilities in our application code is to start assigning risk rankings. Now, we go through a five-step process that we recommend for both our customers, but we also do internally. We, we dog food, we do all of our uh, best practices here at Ender Labs. And so I'm gonna walk you through what that process is because this is going to be the very first steps of you managing vulnerabilities under PCI DSS. The first step that we recommend taking is to start with looking at what is in production and are there fixes available. So these are fairly straightforward, probably not too controversial. Uh, something that is in production is going to cause serious harm to your environment potentially, whereas something that's not in production, it's fairly easy to say that's out of scope. And Darren, I think you kind of said it a little bit tangentially earlier, but a lot of these um, uh, activities related to compliance are focused around what's in scope and what's out of scope, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Like shrink your scope is the way to save yourself tons of money with any kind of compliance. Exactly. And because good compliance should be fueling good security, uh, you can really start to hone in on where you need to set the most stringent controls. So we advise, first of all, if it's not in production, it's probably not going to be um, presenting some serious harm to you. The second is, is there a fix available? Um, so that's not to say that the um, things that don't have fixes shouldn't be looked at. But in our experience, most organizations don't have the resources to deal with uh, risks that don't have a fix available. And so those become either accepted risks or they might get added to a you know backlog for trying to work directly with the vendor or you know the open source maintainer or if you have a team that can patch but that's not going to be a quick fix. So is it in prod? Is there a fix available? That's going to give you a fairly quick uh cut down of your your possible things you need to to worry about. The next thing we look at is reachability, and I'm going to dive deeper into that shortly, but this is looking at, is the vulnerability at a function reachable level? Uh, you know, it's in prod, and someone can actually get from the code that your developers wrote all the way down to the vulnerable function. That's what reachability is looking at. Next, we're going to look at EPSS, which is a um, scoring model that is looking at the probability of exploit. 
Uh, we usually recommend to our customers that they set their EPS score somewhere between three and 5%, but that really depends again on your own uh, risk tolerance. And we'll talk a bit more about EPSS shortly. And then the thing that might be most surprising, and some of you may have noticed, we haven't even said the word yet, is the very last thing that we look at is CBSS. And we'll talk in a little bit about why that is. So let's start with reachability. Let's imagine, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, this, this is a, a topic that, that confuses a lot of people, right? So uh, the, the market has, has decided to talk about reachability a lot and complicate it a lot as a result of it. And really what you're trying to determine when you're doing a reachability analysis is essentially when I have a, a dependency, when I have an application that has a vulnerability in it, I'm not using the whole thing, like almost never. So I want the, the thing that I have from a scope question is, Am I using the part of this vulnerable, this or this uh, package that has a vulnerability in it? Because if my developers didn't use that part, then I don't actually have any risk. So I'm done, right? There's there's nothing that could cause me harm. And so if I start from, hey, there's this function that has a vulnerability in it, what I need to do is I need to build a call back to how do I get to that function? And as you can see, it can get very complicated. And, and this, this picture here is actually a very simplified version of this. Uh, and I need to figure out, is there a path from what we control in my organization, from what my developers wrote, to that vulnerable function? And if there is, then that's something I need to, to consider. Like, this is going to affect me. This is at least theoretically attackable now. If I can prove that it's not the case, there is no path, then I'm done. I don't have a risk because no attacker can come and reach the vulnerability. They can't exploit it. Yeah, so this going back to our concept of managing vulnerabilities, of deciding what is a, a serious risk to your environment, if you've determined that something is not reachable at the function level, then it's not a risk to your environment. So what we want to get on in terms of if you're going to be using reachability as part of your PCI DSS strategy is you need to be able to defend your auditor the way that the reachability analysis was performed, the way reachability was determined. And unfortunately, we found that because there are so many different ways to kind of talk about reachability and interpret reachability, uh, not all SCA tools are going to necessarily reach the level of accuracy or reliability that you might require for PCI DSS compliance. Now, if you're not concerned about compliance, they might potentially be okay for you. But if you're going to be um, saying something is out of scope for compliance purposes, then your auditor is going to expect that your, your reason is defensible. And so there's three things that we tend to see that um, some SCA tools do that we call kind of reachability traps. And so uh, let's talk through these one at a time, Darren. Let's talk about trusting the import statements. So this is when you know, the tool says, uh, has the developer said in the code that they intend to use the package with vulnerability in it? So what does this look like in practice, Darren? So what happens is, you know, developers will say, you know, I'm adopting the, this package and the analyzer will say, hey, look, they, they're using this package. Therefore, you have reachability to vulnerability. And this kind of speaks to the problem is like that that's going to increase your scope quite a bit from what's really there. And because you're you're guessing, right? It's a heuristic. You're saying, hey, if they're using the package, some part of it, they're probably using the vulnerable part of it. What we found out is it doesn't really work in practice, right? In, in practice, people adopt a, a, a open source dependency and they use 10% of it. So like the, when, when a reachability analyzer says, I'm just gonna look at whether the package is in use at all, that gets helpful information. It does reduce your scope somewhat, but it doesn't tell you whether you actually have the vulnerability or not with any kind of reliability. So you end up with a lot of, of you know, false positives is the main problem, um, but you also get some false negatives because you get these things where you're only going one level deep instead of going you know, the dependencies of my dependencies. And so you also get a false negative problem. So it's, it's a good start, but it doesn't get you all the way there. Yeah, so you know, putting it in the PCI DSS uh, compliance mindset, uh, if you have a lot of false positives, 
there are going to be more things for you to quote unquote manage. And so that's going to be more time, more effort. And of course, if you're getting false negatives, then your auditor is probably going to uh, take issue with where you want are on compliance. Uh, the second category that we want to be watching out for for reachability is uh, if the tool only finds your direct dependencies. So going back here, that would mean that it stops at this uh, second column in, and we're not seeing any of the, the third or even further in. So the implication here is fairly obvious and straightforward. You're going to have uh, a lot of false negatives in that nothing here is vulnerable, but clearly we have a dependency uh, deeper in that's vulnerable. And uh, we actually have a true story. Recently, one of our customers detected Log4j in one of their transitive dependencies and did validate that it is fully reachable. So you wanna be looking for a tool that does both direct and transitive dependencies. And then the third category is um, kind of a variation here. It's relying on the fixed commit. So again, it's, it's kind of taking pointers from something that's not necessarily uh, locked to the source of truth. So, you know, this is when it's looking at the change between a vulnerable version and a fixed version, that's the fixed commit. And if saying essentially, if that function changed in the fixed commit, well, then it must be vulnerable, right? And so this can end up producing false positives. So that's what we have to show you in terms of understanding uh, how reachability can help you manage. We're gonna talk a little bit about CVSS and EPSS, and then we're gonna show you what this all looks like in practice. And just a reminder, uh, you're welcome to use the Q&A, you're welcome to use the chat. We'll either answer them live or we'll, we'll type our answers. So uh, as we discussed earlier uh, in the prioritization process, we go, is it in prod? Is there a fix available? Is it function level reachable? How's the EPSS probability? And then very finally, what's the CVSS score? Uh, these are two complementary models. They're both um, curated by the same organization. Criticality came first. And, you know, this was a, a way of saying how bad could it be if this thing was exploited? Um, for better or worse, criticality is uh, not totally unbiased. So probably unsurprising, you know, if a vendor discovers a vulnerability in their project and they report it, they're kind of incentivized uh, to report lower criticality so it doesn't look as bad. Now, not to say that every vendor does that, but it is self-reporting. And then on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a bug bounty, you know, the person who's trying to collect that bounty, the higher the score, the more they get paid. And so we do see that sometimes criticality is not the most reliable, but it's a good point when taken with everything else. EPSS, Exploit Prediction Scoring System, on the other end, is about what's the probability that it will actually be exploited. And again, what we recommend is setting it pretty high. Um, you know, you're not gonna go for uh, what, 70% probability, because that's still 30% risk. Uh, we usually recommend somewhere in the, the three to 5% range. So that's uh, what, 95 to 98% probability of exploit. So these things paired together, you may say, uh, I have a criticality that's a, I don't know, an eight. And the exploit probability is really, really high. And I have a criticality of a 10 with an exploit probability that's really low. And so that's where your, your prioritization and your remediation efforts start to come in. So let's look at what this looks like in practice. This is a screenshot of one of our customers' uh, prioritization dashboard. And we'll go in in just a moment to the product so that you can understand how you can control these things. But to start with the, the scale that we've been discussing, the it's not in test, so it's in production, and there's a fix available. This category of things right here, if it stops here, these are just things you're going to monitor. Uh, you're going to be continuing to look to see, does anything change? From this, anything that you've determined to be function level reachable, 
that's on your, your plan to fix roadmap. And then the things that reach the, the severity that you're concerned about and the criticality that you're concerned about, that's gonna be your fix it right now set of things. So we'll pop over and this is a, a demo version that's available on our free trial. If you go and request our trial, you can start it with a business email and you can do all of this yourself. You can play around with these. So we'll go into a project here. We have a modern repo project with a ton of stuff in it. And as you can see, we have 96 findings. So that's a fairly low number as uh, findings go, you know, in a real environment, you may have hundreds, if not thousands, but this is a test. So what we're gonna start with first are those two categories we were talking about to begin with. Is there a fix available? And is this in production or is it a test dependency? So we started at 96, that immediately takes us down to 60. So the things that are in this group of 60, these are your things that you're gonna be having and monitor at a minimum. So that reduces your total by 62%. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna apply function level reachability. And that brings us down to 14 per, uh, findings, which happens to be about 14% of those total findings that were here. So these are things that are in production, uh, there's a fix available, and they're function level reachable. Now we're gonna do the EPSS probability. Uh, we're gonna keep it fairly high because we might be in a um, you know bank, for example, and we have a really, really low risk tolerance. And so we want just about everything to hit that. So I'm gonna set it at 1%. And now we're down to seven findings. So we're down to about 7% of that original set. Now, at this point, here's when we start to apply criticality. And I'm going to say, because PCI DSS has um, SLIs specifically for criticals and highs, I have to remediate those faster. So I'm going to start by looking at my criticals and highs. And all I have is, what is that? Six criticals. So there you have it. Uh, we've got about a minute left. And if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, what do you want to add, Darren, while we're waiting for some questions to come in? Uh, I think the one of the key pieces that, uh, again, it's a lot of confusion around like EPSS versus CDSS and why we recommend EPSS first is that EPSS is more objective, right? It's, it's a separate organization that's disinterested, who's assessing vulnerabilities against what they see in the wild to make an estimate of probability of exploit. Whereas CVSS is always going to be subjective. Whoever reports the vulnerability gets to decide the CVSS, and so their individual biases are going to come into play. So it is a less objective thing, and that's why we put it after EPSS. Exactly. So uh, when you were, let's say, working at Target, working at CrowdStrike, what were some of the regulations that you had to worry about complying with? Oh, to Target was fun because uh, people think of it as, oh, it's just a store. So it's just got the the uh, retailer PCI, but they're also their own bank. Uh, and I, when I was there before they were using CVS pharmacy, they were also their own pharmacy. So we also had HIPAA and SOX and, uh, you know, both, both halves of PCI and a bunch of like contract stuff as card issuers on behalf of, of Visa and MasterCard. So it was it was a pretty intense regulatory environment for a place that sells socks. You know? Interesting. All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up here. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, we'll send out the recording uh, within the next 24 hours and have a great day. Thanks, Darren.